Hey guys, Mr. Klein here. Uh, we are talking about Chapter 14, Lesson 2 in your textbook, Climate Cycles. Uh, we're going to talk about how climate changes over time. For example, the picture right here that you're seeing is a digital relief of what uh, the planet must have looked like during the last ice age, uh, about 30, 40,000 years ago. So let's go ahead and let's get started. By the end of this lesson, uh, you will be able to answer the following questions. Question number one, how has climate varied over time? And question number two, uh, what causes seasons? And finally, question number three, how does the ocean affect climate? Now, if you've been in elementary school, you learned about the seasons and, you know, you put on heavy coats in winter and, and it gets nice outside and flowers show up in spring and it's warm and sunny in the summer and, f and during autumn the leaves fall, things like that. And that's part of the cycles of climate that go over time. Remember, weather is very short term. It's like here, right now, and in the immediate future. But climate is uh, precipitation, temperature, and other factors over time. And because climate changes in cycles that take much longer, much more than a lifetime to complete, oftentimes we can't really see what goes on with climate. And as you know, climate and climate change and global warming, things like that are debated oftentimes in the news. And some of the data that scientists use to argue back and forth about this come from natural records like what we find in the ice cores, drilled from glaciers and ice sheets. Uh, because what happens is it freezes the dust and particles and, and gases and stuff at the time the ice was laid. So just like tree trunks and tree rings can tell us about uh, the life of a tree, uh, these ice cores can do also. Because what we do is we compare present day climates to those back then thousands or even millions of years ago. And so for example we have graphs like this that, call, that look at changes in temperature, the amount of carbon dioxide in the air, and parts per million in dust, and this comes from uh, this comes from ice cores in Antarctica. So what we did is we drill down, we pull out chunks of ice, and we uh, analyze it just like we do tree rings, like I just said, and things like that. So uh, the cycles of climate on Earth. Generally, we consider changes on Earth in terms of ice ages and interglacial periods. Ice ages, if you remember from uh, previous lessons on geologic history, are cold periods lasting hundreds of millions of years when glaciers, which are big giant rivers of ice, cover the Earth. Now, this isn't always the case. After all, there aren't glaciers all over the place around here right now covering most of continents, except for, you know, Antarctica. But the ice will retreat in what we call interglacial periods. That's the warm periods that occur between the ice ages. Now, if there are no glaciers on Earth after uh, at all, we call that warm periods. So what we're looking at right now in terms of our climate here on Earth, because we still have glaciers, are intergla interglacial periods. Now, uh, just in case you didn't watch my video on uh, geologic history and the Pleistocene era, uh, the most recent ice age began two million years ago. And the current interglacial, interglacial period only began 10,000 years ago with the Holocene epoch. Uh, so right now we are in an ice age. And remember, we are in an ice age because we have glaciers here on Earth. Uh, it might be warm where you're at, but there are glaciers in other places. Therefore, we're considered in an ice age. So what causes these long-term cycles of ice ages and warm periods and interglacials and things like that? Well, that's because Earth's climate changes because the amount of solar energy reaching the Earth changes. Okay, so light from the sun and warmth hitting the Earth causes those changes. Now, one of the factors that affect the amount of solar energy Earth receives is what we call the shape of its orbit. Uh, as the orbit changes, you see Earth's orbit, whenever we go later into uh, talking about astronomy and the solar system, Earth doesn't rotate around the sun in a perfect circle. Rather, it kind of wobbles in between two shapes, between a circle and an oval. So it goes from circular to what we call an elliptical orbit. And as it goes from a circular to elliptical orbit, the average temperature on Earth will decrease because what happens when you go into the elliptical orbit, like in this picture right here, here's the circular orbit right here, and then the dotted line's the elliptical. There'll be times where Earth will get slightly closer to the sun, but there in the elliptical orbit, it goes out further out. And as a result, whenever this comes in closer, this doesn't warm it up quite as much as it would in a nice circular orbit where the amount of heat remains the same. So because it warms and cools, that leads to ice ages. 
In addition, another factor is actually the tilt of the Earth's orbit. At times, it'll go above and below the uh, solar plane, which we'll talk about with the... Uh, we talk about the solar system that's essentially like the equator of the solar system so at times earth will go below the equator of the sun and other times it'll go above it and that will that will change climate cycles also in addition other factors uh, we find are the slow movement of continents through t plate tectonics which will also lead to changes in ocean currents because if you have a continent blocking where an ocean current is flowing obviously you're not going to be able to uh, have that flow of water moving which will change the climate which we'll get into later with something else so so, long-term climate cycles, that's, you know, thousands and millions of years, uh, that's where we get that. But on the other hand, seasons. Now, like we just said, we know about the seasons. Seasons are essentially caused by the amount of solar energy received at different latitudes at different times of the year. And these result in two things. It results in a regular change in temperature, as well as the length of days and nights. Okay, and if we look at this diagram I have right here, you can see this. Earth is tilted at 23 and a half degrees, more or less. It kind of wobbles on it more uh, at times, uh, off of center. But up here in the northern hemisphere, we have sunlight going from the sun and hitting the Earth. And because it's tilted closer to the sun, it'll get more solar energy. So that means there's warmer temperatures and longer days. And when we have warmer temperatures and longer days in the northern hemisphere, of course we know that that's summer. So while summer's taking place in the northern hemisphere, we have the opposite occurring in the southern hemisphere. There's less solar energy reaching it. Uh, and because there's less solar energy, that means there's lower temperatures and there's shorter days. And as a result, that's winter in the southern hemisphere. And so what happens is when Earth rotates uh, halfway around the sun, the opposite happens. The northern hemisphere is further away from the sun, so it gets less solar energy, which means its temperatures are lower, the days are shorter, and it's winter. While that's happening in the southern southern hemisphere, it's getting more solar energy, and the days are longer, and they're warmer, so they have summer. So that's essentially how seasons take place. So solstices and equinoxes. Now you've heard of these. Uh, you might have heard it from time to time. Uh, What's a solstice? Oh, the summer solstice, the winter solstice, that's holidays, or the summer equinox and the, I'm sorry, the spring equinox and the autumnal equinox. You know, you can maybe at that exact moment stand an egg or things like that. You might have heard that. And seasons begin on days that, what we just said, solstices and equinoxes. Okay, uh, solstices mark the beginning of summer and winter, while the equinoxes mark the beginning of spring and autumn. Now, the thing to remember, what's the difference between the two? Is that on the solstice, that's when the day is either the longest day in the summer, it's the longest day of the year where you're at, or the shortest day in winter time. But on equinoxes, neither hemisphere is tilted toward the sun and then the other. As a result, the days are equal in length. So if you look at a sunrise and sunset table, it's easy to find when the equinoxes and solstices are. You find the biggest gap between sunrise and sunset, that's the summer solstice. The smallest gap is the winter solstice. And whenever sunrise and sunset, the difference is are the exact same, uh, that's whenever you have your equinoxes. So let's look at this. So we start off, let's say, with the summer solstice on the 21st of June, okay, in North America. That would be the winter solstice. But bear with me, we'll talk about the northern hemisphere now. So at this point, uh, it's reached this point where in the Earth's, in Earth's rotation where the northern hemisphere is completely facing the sun. It's the closest because of the tilt it's going to get. So that's the longest day of the year. As the Earth rotates around, we get to the autumnal, autumn equinox on the 22nd or 23rd of September. When that happens, the way the Earth is tilted, you see it's still tilted at that 23 and a half degree angle. But because of that, it's tilted to the side the sun is beaming down on the side that we can't quite see equally. So that's that way the day and the night is of equal length. So we go another three months and we get the 22nd of December and we get the winter solstice. The north in the northern hemisphere, shortest day of the year. Because as you can see, it's the opposite. See, the southern hemisphere gets the most uh, sun on that day. And so we go three more months later and once again we're back to the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere receiving equal amounts of light and solar energy and that is the spring equinox. So that's how we know 
when the days of the uh, whenever uh, days of the year uh, are coincide with uh, seasons beginning and ending. Okay, so equinoxes are for spring and autumn, and solstices are for summer and winter. Spring and autumn, you have uh, days and nights of equal length, and then summer and winter are the biggest differences. Summer days are longer, winter's evenings are longer. So that causes cli that's the main cause of climate cycles uh the seasons going but what about el nino and the southern oscillation now you may have heard about el nino in the news in fact when i'm recording this uh we have an el nino pattern going on so let's explain el nino it's kind of a complicated topic but i'm gonna go through it slowly and i have a diagram and so we're going to explain this normally close to equator if you remember the coriolis effect and the wind belt uh, the winds between 30 degrees and the equator are called the trade winds. Okay, and what the trade winds do near the equator, and you see this line of clouds right here uh, on the images below, that's the equator. So the trade winds are just above it and just below it. The trade winds generally will blow from east to west. Okay, and so what happens is because they blow from east to west, they're blowing this away. And it pushes warm waters, which ocean currents bring warm waters right here to South America. And what it does is it pushes it toward Australia. And so all of this warm water gets pushed toward Australia, and it creates two, uh, it creates high pressure and low pressure, okay, because cold water pops up right here to replace it. And cold air generally ha is more dense, so that remember that causes high pressure. So near South America, we have high pressure in this area, and Australia will have low pressure, and that's generally what happens. However, for El Nino to happen, we'll have the trade winds will die down. They won't blow as hard, okay? And this results in the phenomenon that we call El Nino. El Nino meaning the child, meaning the Christ child, and uh, this has to do with Catholic holidays and how we observe this atmospheric change in uh, in South America. Now, because the winds die down, the warm water comes back towards South America, okay? And as a result, uh, the cold water gets blocked. So this is how El Nino works. This is in an El Nino pattern. So what we have here are weak trade winds, okay? They're not blowing as hard. You see them moving toward the equator, okay? They're blowing right here. Now, because of these trade winds are weak, warm water will start moving from east to west, okay? That's how they normally do, okay? Uh, but in El Nino, it gets reversed because they move from west to east, and as a result, the cold ocean water cold ocean water currents are blocked. And so when the cold ocean currents are blocked, we have massive changes to South America's weather. So what happens is, rather than having the low-pressure system in Australia, it's over in South America. So what happens is they have higher precipitation and higher temperatures, and this happens in a lot of places around the world. Okay, El Nino will affect global climates. So, for example, where we're at in South Louisiana, when we have El Nino climates, temperatures tend to be cooler, and there, it's also much wetter, and we have a large rain events. Now, at the time of this recording, about a month ago, uh, three, four, three weeks about a month ago, we had a lot of heavy rain, and we usually have these heavy rains in January because low-pressure systems stall over southern Louisiana during El Nino times, and you can go back and you can count the El Ninos in southern Louisiana when we have these big rain events and these big flooding events, and so if you look at the river stages, that you know the river goes way above flood stage for about a week, well that's because of the rain, and you count the interval of that. Uh, these cycles happen about once every three days eight years and because the currents switch back and forth it's like an oscillating fan you know the fans that turn as they go so this cycle that results in the weakened trade winds in the Pacific Ocean is what we call the El Nino Southern Oscillation or ENSO but basically if you know what El Nino is that's what we just talked about now the other climate cycle that results from an interaction between ocean currents and air and atmosphere is a monsoon. It's a wind circulation pattern that changes direction with the seasons. Uh, if you live in the Rocky Mountains, you kind of know about monsoons because that'll happen, but the most famous ones are in India. So what happens is during summers, warm air over land will rise, and because it rises, it forms a low-pressure system. 
Okay, so the air is rotating counterclockwise. And as a result, it's rotating counterclockwise. It drags all of this warm, moist air from the Indian Ocean over India. As a result, you have lots and lots of rain, you know, feet of rain. So if you see, like, footage of, like, India and Bangladesh and Myanmar right here, and you see, like, you know, the cars are, like, two feet of water and people walking around with the water up to their chins in the summer, well, that's because of the monsoon pattern. Okay, now... On the other hand, in the winter, it's reversed. So cool, the air cools over to land, and it sinks, creating, of course, because air sinks, high pressure. Okay? Oh, I should have wrote that. Well, I'll just type this in right now for you. It'll create high pressure, causing almost no rainfall at all as the wind blows outward. So during the winter time, you have a very dry season going on. Okay, so during a the dry season, this air is cooler and it's pushing out, and as a result, it pushes all the moisture out, and so it's really dry. So monsoon, okay, completely different changes in patterns. In summer, low pressure, air rises, lots of rain falls. Winter time, high pressure sets in, okay, wind blows out to sea, no rain at all. So you either have a bunch of rain or no rain at all with monsoons. Now, the other client, other climatic cycles are things where below average precipitation called drought. Okay, you don't get a lot of rain, you have a drought. And this can hurt the economy by causing water shortages. Droughts are usually accompanied, especially in the summertime, by heat waves or periods of above average temperatures. Now in South Louisiana, we don't really have to worry about cold waves or cold snaps. That happens generally in more northern latitudes when air masses that are cold and dry, remember those from the last lesson on air masses? Well, those are continental polar air masses. Whenever they settle over an area, they cause cold weather for days or even weeks, especially in colder, uh, colder uh, northern latitudes. Okay, so there you go. Everything you need to know about uh, this, but you are afraid to ask for climate cycle. So how has climate varied over time? Well, what's happened is throughout Earth's history, Earth is warmed and cooled through cycles in Earth's climate. When, as soon, as whenever there are glaciers, it's an ice age, Warmer times when we have glaciers are called interglacial periods. Okay, and when there's no glaciers, those are warm periods. Now, what causes seasons? Seasons occur because of Earth's axis being tilted. As a result, it causes unequal heating of parts of the planet as it revolves around the sun. The hemisphere that's closer to the sun, uh, facing the sun, will have summer. The one away from it will have winter. So, and finally, how does ocean affect the climate? Changes in ocean currents result in atmospheric changes like El Nino and the monsoons. Okay, so what happens is uh, with El Nino, remember, instead of the ocean current going from South America toward Australia, weak trade winds push the warm water back, which changes uh, climates around the world. Monsoon is much more regular, it usually happens every year, where you have warm air rising over land, which means cooler air from the ocean uh, because of cool currents push in, creating lots and lots of rain. And then in the winter, it's the opposite, where the cooler air on land pushes out and creates really dry conditions. So that's your lesson, uh, Earth Cycles of Climates. As always, if you have any questions, please let me know. Thanks for watching.